Hello, everyone. Welcome to the AI for Good Innovation Factory. So my name is Josh Choi from the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. I'm very happy to moderate today's uh, Innovation Factory session. Uh, ITU is the um, United Nations Specialized Agency for ICTs, and I know we are also the organizer of the AI for Good uh, Global Summit uh, in partnership with uh, 38 uh, UN sister agencies and co-convened with uh, Switzerland. Uh, the Innovation Factory is a program launched last year under the flagship initiative AI for Good Global Summit. It is an online uh, pitching platform for uh, startups, but not just a pitching event, but also it helps the startups grow and scale their innovative AI solutions to achieve the uh, SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, last year, we received more than 200 applications from 46 countries. And so far this year, we've got uh, more than 140 applications from 35 countries, and it's growing very, very well as a global startup pitching platform. But we are more committed to bridging the gap between solution seekers uh, from UN partners, or governments, or corporates, and a solution and a solution seekers from the startup, so that uh, we can uh, proposition uh, this program uh, more than just a pitching platform, rather and the startup growth accelerating platform and also startup driven SDG a solution exchange hub. All right, so uh, let me kickstart today's sessions, uh, especially today's session is hosted with AWS with the title of Climate Change and AI. Uh, introducing startups uh, innovating new industry solutions. I'm so glad to introduce four innovators today and we are who are uh, combating you know uh, climate changes with their novel AI solutions and technologies. So on behalf of the ITU, I'd like to give a big thanks to Amazon AWS for uh, supporting us to organize this session and uh, bringing uh, amazing startups. So uh, firstly, I'm glad to introduce Ms. Ali K. Miller from AWS. Ali, please uh, give us an uh, opening remark and then tell us a bit more about uh, what AWS is doing to force innovation uh, driven by startups and why this, why this is important. Sure, thank you, Josh, for the nice introduction. So hi, everyone, as Josh men mentioned, my name's Ali Miller, uh, and I serve as the global head of machine learning business development for startups and venture capital at AWS. And we are unbelievably excited to be able to co-host this event with the UN AI for Good group. Uh, I do wanna give just a bit of an introduction on what AWS is doing in this space so that as you are starting your own startups, know of people who are starting startups or investing in startups, whatever, that you're able to take full advantage of what we're offering. So uh, AWS, I think everyone knows, is a large cloud provider, uh, but we're much more than that. We have an entire team that is literally just dedicated to the support and success of startups all over the world. We support over 300,000 global startups. I have colleagues in Chile, Portugal, South Africa, Australia, and we are here to support the entire ecosystem. Doesn't matter if you're two people writing an idea on a napkin, doesn't matter if you're Series H, Aurora Innovation just rang the bell today. We've been working with them for years. And so we are working with startups of all stages, all funding levels. And we're really excited to be able to have some of our early stage startups presenting on their climate change initiatives. We have 25 plus programs supporting startups. So a lot of people know of us as a technical platform. And so obviously we'll give advice on how to solve your AI problems, how to set up your cloud infrastructure, how to think about your database strategy, but we also do co-marketing. We have events like this that we help shine the spotlight on startups. We support on pitch decks. I've helped a startup raise $100 million. We do a whole wide range of things. So when you think of just problems that startups are facing, our team of ex-founders and ex-venture capitalists are really here to help. Um, in, as far as like the industries that we cover, obviously this event is focused on climate change and AI, but we also support startups in healthcare, fintech, media and entertainment, cybersecurity, you name it. Um, so I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense of the breadth. Um, if you literally just Google AWS startups, you'll be able to find Activate, which is our main startup onboarding platform. Every single person can sign up for Activate. Every single person has access to at least $1,000 in free AWS credits if you're a startup. So just search for AWS Activate and someone on our very large team of people who love startups will jump in and support and help. 
I want to transfer and, and kind of switch to the event today. So I was lucky enough to, you know, post on LinkedIn and say this event that we're running, I had a bunch of people reach out saying that they love the UN AI for good whole system. A friend of mine, Rudy reached out saying he's been a part of this initiative for four years. And I think it really comes down to the impact and the fact that these startups are building real tactical solutions. This is not just like, ooh, AI in a box. Wouldn't it be cool if blah, blah, blah. These are like real startups launching real businesses. So I love the tactical aspect. Really excited to see where AI is going in the next several years. We're seeing a lot of shift into AI for good, a lot of shift into startups serving the nonprofit and government and public sector space. We have judges representing venture capital side, sustainability side, government side, and AI. So I'm gonna have Josh uh, go around and help folks introduce themselves. But if you have any questions as it relates to AWS, how we support startups, feel free to throw it in the chat. Me and my colleague are happy to answer. But for the most part, we wanna focus on these four startups who are sharing their businesses today and we can't wait to hear from them. Thanks, Josh. Thank you very much, Ali. And this is, uh, thanks a lot to, for, for your uh, great introduction. So I'm very happy to hear more about what AWS is doing uh, to support startups. And then uh, also we very much look forward to working with you and also have a more and more interesting collaboration to, to help the innovators and the startups to uh, foster better you know, um, innovative ideas and then also uh, the, the, the achieve the SDGs. Thank you very much again. All right, um, Ellie also will be also judging today. And we have three more judges and I'm very pleased to introduce our distinct judges for today's session. Uh, firstly, Ms. B. Cabello, the B.S. Technologist and Facilitator serving as a Congressional Innovation Fellow advising policymakers in the, in the U.S. Senate. And B, tell us more about uh, your work with the policymakers and how you make an impact. Hey there, it's a pleasure to join you all today. And I wanna echo Ali's comments about um, the AI for Good program and just all of the incredible, I'm really excited to hear from the teams today, um, recognizing that you know climate change is one of the biggest threats facing humanity. And I really believe that this is an all hands on deck issue. So um, technology and technologists are really central to overcoming these challenges. And um, as you mentioned, Josh, I'm currently serving as a Congressional Innovation Fellow advising policymakers in the Senate. This means bringing understanding of how things happen in industry and civil society to the government to recognize both where there are opportunities and potentially challenges or constraints with the way that AI is being developed today. Previously, I worked as a research program lead at the Partnership on AI, a nonprofit dedicated to the governance of artificial intelligence. I was also a senior engagement lead at IBM Watson and both product development and community director for Exploding Kittens, which was a crowdfunded gaming startup um, that raised almost $9 million on Kickstarter. So um, definitely have some empathy to the founders here today. Um, I'm bringing in perspective as an MIT Harvard Assembly Fellow and LB LGBT out role model as well. I really think that when we're looking at how we develop um, technology to address these global challenges. It's important for us to think critically about who's brought to the table and how our innovations and our solutions actually serve the entire world and all of the people in it. So really excited to um, be able to be a part of this conversation to hear what folks are working on and um, hopefully uh, do some good scoring and judging today as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks to uh, B for uh, taking your time. Also working as a judge today, so I'm very excited to to work with you today. Great, thanks a lot. Okay, so next, Mr. Jonathan uh, Jonathan Fellows. Uh, Jonathan is a senior product manager within Amazon's worldwide sustainability team. Uh, so, Jonathan, can you explain more about your and your team's main focus of work and why it is important? Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Helena, for, for hosting, by the way, this great event. Jonathan Fellows, as you mentioned, Josh, part of Amazon's brand new worldwide sustainability organization. Uh, I spent my career thus far focused on both e-commerce and cloud computing. And in fact, before sustainability, I led international expansion within AWS. So great to be here. Looking forward to judging. Thank you. 
Thanks a lot. Okay. Well, and the last but not the least, Miss Melissa Tico from Finca Vetches. Uh, Melissa actually will already participate in some of the previous, you know, Innovation Factory sessions as a judge, and uh, she's been ex she's an expert in the impact investing and SME finances and also ESG management. So, Melissa, tell us a little bit more about what the impact funding is about and how Finca Ventures work in the startup scene. Thank you. And yes, ha very happy to be here. Uh, so Melissa Tickle here. I'm uh, an investment manager at Finca Ventures, um, which is an early stage impact investor that invests um, in companies across health, agriculture, and financial inclusion in sub-Saharan Africa. So a little bit of an outlier in terms of geography today, but uh, these challenges exist uh, everywhere. Um, so excited to learn about the solutions that are presented today. Um, and very interested in initiatives more generally that are helping make agriculture more climate resilient, um, especially as it relates to smaller scale uh, farmers across Africa and, and the work that we do. Thanks a lot, uh, Melissa, for the great introduction. All right. Okay, so thanks a lot to all our judges for taking your time today. And uh, before moving on to the pitching, I'd like to inform all the audience that there is a chat functionality, so everybody can leave some comments and questions. And just make sure to set the, uh, the message recipient to all panelists and attendees, not just to all panelists, so that everybody can see the questions and interact. So you can select this uh, just above the message box. Okay, so now let's move on to the uh, pitching. I'm so excited. So first stage is for WeBe. And a WeB uh, is a building a smarter reinsurance model. Uh, no, it's a WeB provides a, a no code and end to end IoT tool set powered by AI and computer vision that allows a simple connectivity through sensors and devices. So uh, the CEO and co founder Cecilia Flores here. So, Cecilia, yeah, the stage is yours and you have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Let me just. Can you see my presentation? Excellent. Yes. All right. All right. So what we do at WIBI is we provide real-time visibility for food, beverage, agriculture, and CBG. Um, you know that one third of all the food produced in the world every year goes to waste, and 40% of that amount is due to inefficiencies either during a manufacturing processes or agricultural activity. This, this not only represents a high impact on CO emissions, but also the use of natural resources to produce food that eventually will go to waste. Some of the issues, underlying issues that cause these inefficiencies are the extensive amount of manual controls that, human, uh, that lead to human errors, the lack of visibility on critical processes, the delayed and problem detection uh, that causes inefficiencies and losses, and then in the end, how complicated and expensive it could be to deploy effective IoT solutions that can also scale from POC into production. So what we created at Weebee is a no-code application marketplace so that organizations in this industry can access real-time insights about their operations in real time, and they can access it anywhere. So um, our no-code tool set is really a, a virtual canvas so that users can use pre-built applications that accelerate the deployment of the most common use cases in these industries, but they can also always go back to the canvas and make any change they need without the need of a specialized engineering, which is one of the big barriers for technology adoption in, in agriculture and manufacturing. So it's a scalable and secure, and it also reduces implementation times from months to just days, and in some cases, hours, and it's super simple to deploy. We basically cover the whole end-to-end -end on deployment of these type of applications, which is the beginning is how do we collect data? It could be either through more than 700 sensors that are already onboarded on the platform with LoRaWAN connectivity that makes it possible for connectivity in uh, such as uh, places with scarce connectivity, such as agriculture, most of the scenarios in agriculture. Then they can also onboard uh, other data points, such as I mean, SAP or SCADA system, PLCs, whatever it is, the data source they want to aggregate into the platform. The platform will automatically normalize the data. And, and then the user will be able to create workflows or go back to change the workflows and use artificial intelligence to make the data produce the insights that they need so they can essentially uh, create efficiency in their processes. 
And let me explain you that through a couple of examples. One of the pre-built solutions and, and one of the main use cases in agriculture is optimizing the irrigation system. So irrigation system normally turn on and off the bulbs so they can you know, um, remotely know exactly when to water the, the plants or the plantation, but they don't exactly know how much, um, uh, how much water is needed at every uh, day, time of the day and depending on the type of plant. This also has a lot of variation due to climate change. So the client by accessing multiple data points, they can know exactly how much amount of water is needed at every time of the day. So what we're doing is measuring soil condition, plant and electrical conductivity, uh, as well as weather um, station information and the weather forecast. All of this information combined and processed through AI give them a 99% water efficiency, improve uh, on the water efficiency, and then they can control and predict the ball behavior based on this uh, analysis of the data. So another use case for factories or for those organizations working with rotative machines, we help them understand exactly what is the, the health of the machine at every time so they can avoid downtime. Whenever there's downtime, there's food losses associated with this, and it represents a massive amount of impact on carbon footprint. So by understanding exactly how much amount, uh, so the behavior of the machine in acceleration, migration, temperature, or energy, processing that data through AI, and detective anomalies in the plant, they understand exactly what's going on and they can prevent um, downtime. The client could, this client could improve uh, the operational efficiency to 87% uh, and eliminate a lot of other costs associated with maintenance that is usually not effective for legacy machines as well. The client went beyond that to also understand energy consumption throughout the plant so they know exactly when other anomalies could be happening and they can commit to their carbon footprint goals which is something that they are starting to see at a global scale. They also have the ability to connect legacy and auxiliary machine, which is usually very um, older equipment that is not automated and they cannot have any visibility about this, the, um, the behavior of the, of the machines. So all of these combined in our marketplace, the users can download the applications and the pre-built algorithms and pre-built solutions to get started. And then they can continue to add multiple data sources so they can add much more intelligence to the system. Once they start seeing the benefit of it, it's easier to get them to continue uh, through that growing plan um, and a technology adoption internally. So these are some of our clients, existing clients, and then partners that are enabling our technology. And then as a wrap up, our company um, is fully committed to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We were selected as winners of a major competition last year as a best uh, US SaaS um, uh, company. And then we were also the winners of the agriculture as a best agriculture and farming product uh, on the Cloud and SaaS Awards early this year. Thank you very much. I don't know if I met my five minute. <laughs> it was super fast. Um, amazing. It's exactly five minutes. Thank you very much for keeping the time. <laughs> Great. All excellent. Okay. So now Q&A session. So anybody can start. Okay. Ali, please go on. See, like great work. Thank you for walking us through. I don't know how you in five minutes gave us multiple use cases. That was very impressive. Uh, I would just love to, to hear a bit more about the team behind it. Um, mm -hmm. What's your team? What's the background makeup of the team? Yeah. So um, myself, I'm the founder of the uh, co-founder of the company. My background is in manufacturing. I work for manufacturing companies, that part of the Navy Star, an affiliate of Navy Star Corporation, and then also on the on Xerox and different divisions within the public and public sector. Where I got all the enterprise. Uh, experience. And then we do have, so I come from the enterprise world and my co-founder, Lucas, which is also the CEO, he has engineering background and he's a all times entrepreneur. This is a, his second startup. Uh, he specialized in IoT. You know, he's been working in IoT for the last 20 years. And, and we also do have a, uh, a team of 25 uh, people between the business customer success and engineering that are working to build this amazing platform behind the scenes. All type of different uh, knowledge from, of course, the development of the software skills to data analytics and data science. So, Great, thanks. Yeah. Jonathan just taught me about the hand raise function. So now we're gonna do this from this point on. <laughs> Jonathan, go ahead. Thanks, and Cecilia, uh, great presentation, a lot of content there covered uh, in short order. A couple of questions for you on my side, I jotted down. First of all, to what extent are you working with third-party certifiers or NGOs to help elevate sustainability standards? So that is, so as a startup, we, you know, the first point for us is to prove the product. 
So IoT and AI at scale and democratizing these solutions is, is complicated to get them up and running. So our first goal was to understand what, what is the state of the art in terms of companies and sustainability and where are they standing in terms of sustainability to then develop the, the, the use cases that could replicate globally. So our goal is to go, you know, we have a very low entry point in terms of cost. So our goal is to really continue to develop this uh, market, uh, marketplace so we can extend to the global community, including you know, nonprofit organizations. We do work with a lot of startups that are trying to develop IoT products so they can use our platform and they can, you know, avoid the hassle of developing your own connectivity, end-to-end -end connectivity, which is expensive, it's costly, it's you know, time consuming and confusing. So it is along the way in our plan to extend it to the global community so they can all use these market-ready solutions. The first step was to understand what's going on, what are the major problems, like the water irrigation system is something that is applies globally and a lot of organizations are dealing with it. So having the precision on the data, knowing the algorithm, then we can expand it to the world. Thank you. I'm curious, um, you know, you talked about some of the, the conversations that you're having with, um, with partners and with um, other companies that might be clients. I'm curious kind of, you seem to be doing things all across the spectrum here. So. Is there a particular target um, in terms of what you're trying to grow into, or are you only targeting those customers that are kind of covering that full end to end? Yeah, so good question. So this, and this has to do with technology adoption. So we are covering, we are focused in, in food manufacturing and agriculture mainly. That is our main area, area of expertise, but we're building use cases that can go throughout both industries. So if you talk about rotative machines, this is something that you can, you, you know, you see a lot of challenges in, in agriculture as well, right? Or industrial agriculture. So by building the building blocks, which are all these uh, use cases, multiple use cases, we can then deploy them throughout the whole industry. So our main focus is to learn what's going on first. You know, this last couple of, uh, of years, we have been focusing and learning what are the use cases that are more re replic we can replicate more in the industry. And that's what is, you know, brought us to, you know, kind of build the market ready solution so they can be easily and truly known code. Um. Thanks. Would, would you be able to just touch on uh, on competition and, and what alternative solutions exist or and um, kind of how you see yourself differentiated from what's already out there? So in terms of competition, the landscape is pretty confusing and noisy in the in the IoT world. So it depends on how you look at us. So in terms of no code, there are other solutions, no code, but there are not solutions that are specified in food industry only. You no know, solutions that are, you know, have use cases that replicate to agriculture and food in, in detail. And then we also have the ability, you know, the platform approach is important because it differentiates us from niche solutions as well, which are some of the companies that are just building one specific solution for one of the challenges in the industry. What we know and what we do differently is that we start with the use case. We are not, we, we don't go top down, you know, like this is the digital transformation and we have to onboard the whole organization. We start by fixing one specific problem in the production, in the front line, we like to call the front line, and then we start scaling in. This reduces the friction for technology adoption and accelerate the process internally. So in that sense, there are not a lot of companies that are having the same approach in terms of how we approach the market. So a lot of the cases when you talk to agriculture organizations or food manufacturers, they don't talk about IoT. They talk much more. They like to talk about their pain point. Where are the areas of efficiency that they need to make the most progress fast enough so they can prove the technology? So in that differentiation, that there are not a lot of other companies in the same space with the same type of approach. But we do so. We do see some that have you know more customized solutions, but not someone that has like the platform approach. Quick question. So one of the um, issues that we've seen with marketplaces or model zoos is that when you're not the model creator yourself and you're relying on third party models, um, that there can be issues with model quality or model accuracy or model retraining. So how are you managing? I'm assuming that the models are created by others. I was you know, interested in a bit of the business model, but how are you maintaining model quality when the models are created by others and put into your marketplace? So 
Um, so we do collaborate at this stage of the company. We do collaborate with the users that are actually creating the models because you know that's what essentially will become a customized solution, a pre-built module inside the platform. So we do make sure that the models are being accurate and then that the clients can customize it and replace it based on the data they need to see or the variables they need to measure or the type of control that they they have. So right now, is the, the, the solutions in the marketplace are handled by us, are controlled by us. So we do control that, you know, the solutions are optimized and the data is accurate. And so if you're managing each one, how do you plan to scale to a thousand models in there? Well, we do have a certification plan and a certification process for the models internally, where we run them through our process and we make sure that they are accurate and the data that they are delivering is accurate for the users. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, we have two more minutes. So perhaps really, really last question from one judge, if possible. Anyone would like to ask additional question? I can ask one more. Um, I'm curious for revenue, what percentage has been, or I guess what the breakdown is between the farm versus the factory uh, use case? A good question. It's, it's actually, uh, half of it in on the farming side in our on the recurring revenue only right so on the software subscription is half on the agricultural side and half is in manufacturing at this point yeah okay well uh, thanks a lot uh to cecilia for your presentation also thanks a lot to our judges for q a and then a uh, very much um Okay, this is a five minute pitch and 10 minute QA. So, you guys are really great on the time. Thank you very much for yeah. taking your time. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, let's move to uh, the second pitch now. Uh, we'll be done by Josh, Kettle. 30 seconds. Yes. Quickly um, do the scoring after each one. Oh, yes. Please go on. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so while I have a short introduction to to uh, to the second team, right? You guys can do that, right? So uh, the cattle is building a smart reinsurance model for protecting the world from the catastrophic effects of climate change. So cattle's co-founder and CEO, I think Nathaniel Manning is here to do the pitch. Okay, so I can give a little bit of time for our judges to make the score just for a few seconds. And then uh, after that, you can, you, you can start. Just let me know when. Yeah, <laughs> sure, no problem. Hey, Josh, I think we're good. We can move forward. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so Nathaniel, please go on. Hi, everybody. My name is Nathaniel Manning. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kettle, uh, and our mission is really about balancing risk in the changing climate. And what we do is we use deep learning to reshape the reinsurance industry. I like to call it using 21st century technology to uh, underwrite and understand 21st century risks. Uh, I come from a background, I was the CEO uh, at Ushahidi, uh, one of the largest uh, open source software platforms for crisis response. Uh, and so I worked uh, building software for first responders. Uh, I also worked uh, in the White House and in 2012, 2013 as the first chief data officer at USAID, uh, opening up data for humanitarian response. And what I saw working in this first response uh, was how much and how important uh, the insurance industry was, and really the reinsurance industry was, uh, to battling and building a better safety net, a really a safety net below the safety net uh, for uh, everyone who's getting affected by these increasing climate disasters. 
the other uh, co-founders I'm with have over 50 combined years of experience from the reinsurance sector. Uh, and our team has now actually grown uh, to over uh, 22 people. Uh, so you might say, what is reinsurance? Uh, well, uh, it's known as insurance for insurance companies. Uh, it's a $400 billion industry that's 630 years old. Uh, and essentially what it is, uh, is the insurance layer for catastrophic risk, essentially the things that are being exacerbated by climate change. Uh, there has been a 3x increase in billion dollar catastrophes over the last 15 years. And that has caused a 68% drop in return on equity for the reinsurance industry. Uh, there's a really good reason why. Uh, essentially, the models are no longer, work, no longer working because what is reinsurance? Reinsurance is basically just a, or any insurance, it's an actuarial model. It is the OG data scientist. Uh, and we're still using stochastic modeling, uh, which is a 100-year-old statistical tool. And you know what? We can land spaceships back on Earth and drive cars uh, using machine learning. So why is this old industry that invented data science still uh, so behind the times? Uh, well, part of that is the classic innovator's dilemma. Uh, the big reinsurers are stuck in the past. Uh, it is hard for them to adopt new technology. Uh, one of my favorite quotes was in asking uh, a previous reinsurer that we were if they wanted to run the model go from 100,000 to 1 million simula uh, simulations. Uh, what would that take? And they said it would take about 6 to 12 months to get their servers up and running. Uh, we use this little thing called AWS now instead. Um, uh, also, with the reality of COVID and these increasing climate disasters, we've seen a 200 increase uh, per, uh, percent increase in some of these, these perils, specifically wildfire, which is the first product we're bringing to market. And in addition, the traditional uh, technology sector who get, go after this uh, area, they, they adopt a software as a service model, which might seem smart, right? But what I always like to say is if you really believed that you uh, had build a model that could trend gold prices, why would you sell that for $10,000 a month to hedge funds? Uh, instead, uh, put your money where your models are. So we've actually built a full stack reinsurer and we sell reinsurance, not specifically a software contract. Uh, and again, that's a, instead of the $4 billion industry selling models, it's the $400 billion industry sitting right behind it. So what we do is we gather geospatial data, weather data, real estate data. We put all that through ETL pipelines and make it and put it into the sense and structure that we want. We downscale it. Uh, and, and then we run what's called our swarm neural networks, uh, which are uh, convoluted neural networks uh, written in parallel, uh, each trained on a specific key variable around the risk. And they work an ensemble methodology to best predict and understand the risk. We've gotten to an 89.7% um, F1 score precision recall versus maybe 62% the best. And to give you just what that really means, the norm, the best in class right now for predicting uh, risk uh, is to run maybe 100K simulations based on historical wildfire data. So, hey, if this spot in California or this spot in Australia has burned down uh, twice in the last 500 years, we're going to call it a 1 in 250 chance of burning down. We run 500 billion <laughs> simulations every turn of our model, um, uh, which just gives us that brute force understanding uh, and ultimately yields to a much better return on equity for our capital providers. Uh, just a concept, the product is live. Um, we are currently quoting business uh, in California as our first market that we're working with, but we are also licensed through Bermuda, which means that we can quote and work anywhere in the world, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, we uh, also, or, or that partnership is through Amwins, the largest wholesale uh, uh, seller of insurance in the world. So lastly, just the unit economics, and then I'll, I'll end here. Uh, you might ask, how do you, as a startup, reinsure? Great, we raised a nice little chunk of money. Now we can reinsure three houses in Palo Alto. Um, well, what you're doing is, uh, is actually brokering uh, other capital uh, that's out there that's looking to best understand the risk. Uh, we put the deals together uh, and build uh, the software and APIs and everything to run the whole system and put our models to work, uh, take the fee there, uh, much like someone putting money into a hedge fund or to a venture fund, et cetera. In fact, our LPs are literally the same uh, big pots of monies, pension funds, uh, et cetera, endowments. Uh, and then we end up taking about 12% net revenue when we don't hold any of the risk ourselves. And then we build our own balance sheet to invest peri pursue alongside of our investors, uh, giving us uh, a little of exposure to the risk, but also a higher profit margin uh, when we are right. So that's, uh, that's our story and happy to answer any questions you have. 
Uh, thank you, Nathaniel. Again, thank you for nailing the timing, exactly five minutes. Okay, so we have a 10 minutes of Q&A. So yeah, I'll raise a hand. Anyone can start us, maybe Jonathan? Sure, I can jump in. Nathaniel, thanks for the presentation. A couple questions on my side. Uh, first of all, you discussed asynchronous satellite imagery. I assume you're using a provider like Digital Globe or even open source data sets from AWS for, for imagery. Um, what other sources you get it directly of data from you? Sorry? I'm sorry, we get it directly from NASA and NOAA. Perfect. What other data sources are you using beyond imagery for building into your forecasting models? Uh, real estate data um, mm -hmm. that we grab and purchase. Uh, and then we, we downscale a lot of that satellite imagery. Uh, and then some of the newer satellite types that have infrared uh, sensors or other types of sensors. The nice part about the NASA, the MODIS and LIDARs, um, is that it's got 30 years of history, right? And so when you're training models, you can train off of a lot of data, uh, whereas like Planet, incredibly accurate, but that that unit went up about five years ago. Their newest sessions are up in like last six months. Um, so uh, really exciting of what they're bringing out. And it lets us uh, begin to look and target, you know, do targeted placement and then look at the data, like a fire just started, let's send a satellite over there uh, and start to build those. Uh, but, um, but, you know, you can't, that investment the U.S. government made 35 years ago is uh, is incredible um, that we get to all use that. So that's uh, those are the main ones, um, and then downscaling basically off of that, uh, which creates our own private databases that we that we keep. Makes sense. And a quick follow up here for you. I mean, beyond predicting the likelihood or severity of natural disasters, to what extent do you plan on using your data to help mitigate the impact or the risk of these events to begin with? I love that you asked that question. So we have, um, what's amazing about insurance is that the incentives are all aligned. So unlike most reinsurance companies, we actually, uh, we can't make our code open source, but we make all of our insights and, uh, and basically ultimate ending data uh, open. Uh, and we give it to people who work in mitigation, in government, uh, essentially decision makers, because guess what? If they use it to make better decisions, then there'll be less claims, which means Honestly, we make more money, um, and so that's great. Um, so uh, we we actually give away that whole front end. Uh, the existing industry is just Excel spreadsheets sent around an email, um, whereas we actually have a application layer that we give access to. There's one that's for private with private information for our customers, and then there's another one that we can make public. And we've given that to Cal Fire so far. We've given that to a handful of mitigation uh, teams that uh, specifically do. Honestly, they use it for marketing, but like to go after specific areas that they help with um, with defensible space and home hardening. Um, and so they go, hey, these are the areas that we need to go focus on and partner with. Uh, and then we give it away to academics um, if they if they want and need it. And uh, can you stop screen sharing now? Sure. I, I thought we might be uh, jumping around to some slides, but um, to actually to your first question, I didn't need to jump. On appendix. We always love a good appendix. Not have a good appendix. Those are all the data sources. Um, I, I meant to jump to this, uh, but, uh, and we do grab some from AWS. Um, all right, I'll stop sharing. I'll throw in with my questions. So for, fantastic pitch. Thank you for going. Uh, deep into the AI models. I always like to appreciate those slides. Yeah. On the, um, you know, particularly when you're selling into an older industry and particularly when you're talking about preventing risk, it's really hard, or at least we've seen that it can be very hard to convince people that they should invest in this space. It's those two things combined. And so you're kind of at the heart of both of those. Um, I kind of just want to get into like, maybe the psychology of it, but like what unlocks um, value for the person on the other side where they go, okay, now I get it. Now I'm fully bought in. What is the, the wow moment um, when they're looking at your output? Is it the accuracy of the model? Is it like, walk me through just a little bit of that. And, and specifically you mean the capital providers in this case? Yeah. Um, is that right? Um, so it's, uh, it's, there are a couple of key things. Um, one, uh, is, uh, and the first is, is basically, and so this gets a little finance focused, but like, it's a, uh, it's an uncorrelated asset. And so what people love about that, when they're building a big portfolio, if you have, if you're a pension fund with 200 million billion dollars under management, 
you have a team that's got in treasury bonds, you have a team that focuses in equities, and then you have a little pocket that's like looking at alternative assets, you put a lot into venture funds, but you have a specific group that's like, I want to create a diversified portfolio. And in this case, if the market crashes, that has nothing to do with whether or not there are more or less fires in California this year. And whether or not there are more or less claims losses in wildfire or hurricane or, you know, and we'll move into many other, other perils, um, it's completely uncorrelated from the financial economic system of the world. Um, so, uh, and we haven't moved into pandemic yet. Um, so, uh, caveat. So that's the uh, that, that's the main thing. It's the first one. People have an uncorrelated asset uh, for diversification. The second is the ESG angle. What are they really doing? They're saying, hey, I'm going to put my money to work. I'm going to earn a nice 8 to 12% return. And when I don't earn a return, what I'm doing is helping people rebuild their houses after they were burned down. I, I, maybe I'll just feel a little better about the fact that I only got a 2% return this year. And the rest of my money went to like helping people rebuild their houses after they burned down from climate change, right? So there's a little bit of that ESG good feeling to it. Um, and uh, uh, I had three. I think the third is is essentially what you said. It's the belief in the model and the belief in the uh, in the company and being like, oh, you actually are. You have alpha. You have an ability to better understand this risk than the norm. You can come in and bring price stability back. I didn't even get into pricing into this this market, and uh, and therefore you're going to uh, you're going to outperform, and you're going to get me a higher return. Great, thanks, Nathaniel. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, you might have mentioned this, but how many clients do you have currently, or insurance providers are you working with? We are currently quoting 24 different insurance providers um, for this upcoming next year. Right now, we are working with, uh, it's a little community, we're working with a, a wholesaler who then represents many, sells through many agents and different types. Uh, so it's that one wholesaler, but that one wholesaler, uh, basically, it's wholesale. So quotes to literally every primary mm -hmm. insurance industry is confusing. Um, <laughs> but uh but through that one wholesaler, uh, and then we are, um, yeah, we are currently quoting in the market and then they've got a, and I didn't even get into the products, but we basically have a parametric product, a fat high value home product, and then what's called this um, catastrophic slice kind of bundling product, so. Got it. And then I guess based off of the experience you've had so far with the wholesaler and who they're selling to, do you have a sense of how long the sales cycle will be for getting some of these insurance providers onboarded? Yeah, um, it's a uh, it's about three to six months. Um, uh, although it's so the whole thing runs through brokers. Um, and it's three to six months once there's interest. So what the sales cycle looks like quickly is like we sign an NDA, we give a presentation, they get excited, then they send us their book. And we run it through our model. And so we're looking at their 56,000 homes or something, and then we're quoting them. And then we're talking about which product they're looking for. It might be that we're pulling a thousand of those homes out and putting them into their own bundle and, and, and insuring them in their own. Um, it could be that we're attaching onto the whole thing. Uh, it could be that we're selling their parametric product through it. So um, we, we do that. Um, we then go back and forth a whole lot. Uh, with the customer because when these deals are done, they are um, eight and nine figure deals. So it's like usually a, a one to 10 to million dollar or, or one ones and tens of millions of dollars purchase. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's the chief risk officer who's the buyer. Uh, and, and then they have to get all the actuaries to sign off as well. And, and then we give a bunch of technical details and they go, do I really believe you? And they either are like, this is really cool. I'm so glad someone's finally bringing modernization to our industry, or they are the type that's like, why do you think you're smarter than me? Um, and that's not our partner. Um, so, and that's, uh, and then, and then essentially it comes to binding and you have to get each, each uh, group to agree. And usually most things are signed at, at the end of each quarter. So hence, it's kind of like you kind of work on it for a quarter and then you negotiate for the next quarter and then you sign. So ideally about a six month process. Or are we on time, Josh? Yeah. Well, last one. No, yeah. no, no, no. You can go in. You can go on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you you have your eye on the time. Good to hear. Um, okay. So um, you talked about the global opportunity that exists here um, in terms of the data and also your corporate structure. 
Um, and, you know, speaking my language, I, I serve as a AI ethics and industry subject matter expert for the Frontier Development Lab, which is an initiative of NASA to put together space problems and AI problems. So um, <laughs> lots, lots of alignment um, with the use of government data there. But I'm curious um, from a compliance angle, as you're approaching these conversations in other markets, is that a hurdle for you all or are you, how do you kind of navigate and how is your team set up to navigate growth um, in this kind of global marketplace? Um, there's a, there, so essentially one of the nice parts is um, of massive consolidation and monopolies in the space is that the, the two brokers uh, that uh, basically which are uh, Guy Carp and Aon control about 90% of the market and they quote about 90% of the reinsurance industry. And just like buying a house, you actually have to have a broker. It's like required legally. Um, uh, and, uh, and they basically manage the entire Western world and basically everywhere but China. Um, and uh, so we work with them here and you go, hey, we wanna start working in Australia now. Can you put us in touch with your colleagues? Um, Bermuda, it, we didn't even get into this, but is the, the preferred uh, regulatory entity for reinsurance by everyone in the world there in Switzerland, essentially, uh, and because they're actually more stringent and on top of it than like the SEC. Um, and uh, they've never had a default in 600 years. So uh, we're structured there, which means we can really sell to everywhere, pretty much everywhere, but China and like North Korea. So um those two things are really good. The satellite imagery is everywhere. You can't really get good weather data in a lot of the developing world. Um, and so then the question is how good is the, the weather data in that specific country? How good, how clean is it? Um, but there are some great new data providers. Um, you'll probably see like grow intelligence, mostly working in agriculture where you can get some interesting stuff, um, but you can get really far in satellite data too. And honestly, the bar is so low on prediction anyway, that it's sort of like, I think we can get pretty far. So it gives us, there's, there's actually a pretty straight, straight shot. Um, honestly, the biggest deterrent is um, is price. Um, you can make a lot more money right now in one spot, and we're constrained by how much capital we have to work with, right? And so, uh, if you can only have half of, if you only have a billion dollars worth of risk that you can deploy uh, and cover, and you can get, you know, thirty cents on a dollar in California right now because um, the prices are crazy, and everywhere else you can get five cents. Um, you're obviously, as a business, going to take the the, the, the other one. So, um, but as we grow, we can grow geographically really easily too. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So time's up. And thank you thanks very much, Nathaniel, for your presentation. And thanks a lot again to now Jeffrey. So great in a question and answers. Uh, everything is so great. And um, yeah, well, while the, the judges are uh, making the scores, I'm going to introduce the, uh, the third team the Windborne uh, Systems, uh, the CEO, the, the Paige Brown is here. So Windborne is supercharging weather models with constellation of smart weather balloons collecting the data no one else has in order to help humanity adapt to some of the most immediately in the destructive aspects of climate change. So Paige, if you are ready, you can share your screen now. Yes, thank you. One second. Okay. So good. Yes. Oh, so you have also five minutes and there's a 10 minutes Q and A. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Let's start. Uh, ready to go. Wonderful. Um, so, Windborn is uh, helping humanity adapt to climate change, and uh, we're taking a reimagined approach to weather forecasting. So, we're launching constellations of smart weather balloons that are targeted to access the data that nobody else can reach right now. Then, we're enhancing this massive data set with machine learning to create hybrid machine learning weather models. Uh, first, let's, let's talk a bit about hurricanes. So when you're in a path of a hurricane, there's really not much time to make a life or death decision. Underreacting could be deadly, but we really don't have the money to overreact either because it costs up to a million dollars to evacuate each mile of coastline. 
So the problem is that we can't trust the forecasts because these evacuations are called wrong all the time. So to predict events like these, meteorologists are really desperate for what's known as the gold standard of weather data, in situ data. They will literally fly planes into hurricanes to get just a few measurements. And it's worth it because it works. So these samples, imp these few samples improve hurricane forecast accuracy by 25 to 30%. But this type of sampling is not scalable due to the cost. So forecasting more than four to five days out requires data from all around the world. Most of the world's in situ data comes from balloons that last about two hours. But these balloons aren't launched over the ocean. And in places like Africa and South America and the Pacific Islands, coverage can be extremely sparse. Uh, so satellites are an imperfect su substitute because they can't measure critical weather components like clear air wind, and they're limited by interference at the lower levels of the atmosphere. So due to the global nature of weather, we face weather uncertainty even in places like the U.S. So you remember that cold snap in Texas last February? That killed over 700 people, and it was the result of a weakening polar vortex due to a warming Arctic. Climate change is here, and the world is not prepared for the coming increases in extreme weather due to climate change. In 2020, the world suffered $200 billion in economic damages, and over 900 million people were impacted. Let's be honest with ourselves. When it comes to climate change, the world is nowhere near ready. The good news is that economic demand is already out there to solve this problem. In core human industries like energy and agriculture, there are opportunities to save and make billions with better information about weather, like helping utilities adapt to renewables or helping shipping companies minimize their fuel burn. So Windborne is collecting the data that no one else can access with our aerial sensing platform. It's a balloon system that can currently access 10 to 100 times more data per dollar. It can fly from the surface to the stratosphere and it can navigate to target the most impactful data in the atmosphere. So we plan to deploy these smart balloons in a global constellation, creating a data set with more in situ data than ever before. But to fully understand the full scope of what our data unlocks and where AI comes in, you need to understand a little bit about weather models. So weather models work by running the equations of motion and heat transfer in the atmosphere and uh, predicting what will happen next. So there's some processes that we have a hard time modeling with that, um, either because it requires too, too much computation or because the science itself isn't well understood. So we use parametrizations. These are shortcuts in the physics that are hand-tuned um, by humans uh, to with magic numbers that are derived from papers published in the 70s. So an example of this is snowflake formation there is not enough processing power in the world to simulate the accumulation of each water molecule onto a snowflake. So weather models rely on handwritten guesses. This is practically a textbook case for deep learning. So long as you have the training data for it, a data set that we are creating. Similar limitations apply after a weather model has been run. You have coarse weather model outputs that are broadly correct, but miss a lot of subtleties, like the effects of terrain. There's frequently a human in the loop to interpret the model outputs and account for these subtleties. With the windborne data that we're collecting, we can train a model to replace that human in the loop with something far better. Our vision is a hybrid ML approach. Combine the proven physics core with the power of machine learning unlocked by our unique data set. So let's recap. We start with a constellation of balloons measuring data no one else can access. We use that to forecast weather with new data and hybrid ML models. And then we incorporate the model outputs into an analytics product designed to streamline the decision-making process across many industries. And we're the team to make this happen. I've been launching weather balloons since I was 14 years old. Our co-founding team has spent a combined 70,000 hours developing this technology, starting from our undergrad at Stanford University. We've got three co-founders with AI talent including one who worked in Fei Fei Li's AI lab. We've grown to a 12 person team, including a chief meteorologist who built IBM's proprietary weather model. We, our preliminary results have been tested and verified by the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Since 2019, when we spun out of Stanford as a company, we've conducted 250 flights around the world, including pilots for the Air Force in the Pacific and an international research effort funded by the Office of Naval Research in the Arctic. 
we racked up over 2.3 years of flight time, giving us deep insights into atmospheric dynamics and constellation operations. And we plan to continue to scale, initially through pilots, then graduating to persistent coverage, first in one geography, then accelerating growth as we bring on each geography in the scale up to global coverage. But scaling doesn't stop there. We want to continue to scale down unit size and cost and scale up endurance and density, creating a dominant weather insights company powered by a massive proprietary data set and an innovative AI approach to forecasting the weather. We plan to help humanity adapt to climate change with information that informs life or death decisions. We are reimagining weather and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Paige, for your, again, uh, very timely presentation. Okay, so yeah, Jonathan, you can start. Thanks, Paige. Talk to me about regulatory hurdles. I have mm -hmm. to imagine this would raise some eyebrows at FAA and other organizations. How do you plan to overcome these types of hurdles? Yes, so we've been working very closely with the FAA um, throughout this process from the very early days of, our, of when this became a project. And basically, the FAA reg regulations on balloons go down to six pounds. When a balloon is less than six pounds, it's considered too small to regulate. Um, and so our balloons fall below that six pound limit. And so the only regulation around this is that we operate safely. And so we work to deconflict with aircraft and we work to operate in as safe a manner as possible by notifying um, aircraft in the vicinity when we're, do when we're conducting launches. Um, but it doesn't require much regulatory oversight from the FAA or other global aviation organizations because of uh, the small size and weight of our system. I understand that now, and I could be misremembering, but I thought you included a vision to, to focus on larger balloons eventually oh, in the fullness of time. Yes, I think you misunderstood that. So our, our vision is to scale down in size and weight. So we, we want to continue to make these balloons smaller and smaller and continue to make them um, as safe as possible for operating in the, in the atmosphere. Got it. Just one more question. Um, in terms of, let's say, global volume of balloons, uh, what type of coverage do you need to hit critical mass to really be able to provide actionable data for customers on Earth? Yeah, so we've already um, we've already demonstrated improvement with just 36 balloons launched over two weeks. Um, so that's a very sparse coverage, and you know it's a very small improvement initially. But we're um, we're looking to cover. I, I think with just a couple thousand balloons over the world, we could get the kind of coverage that we need to, um, to actually have a significant impact on forecast accuracy. Thank you, Paige. I'm curious if you could talk, um, maybe extending on that question a little bit about um, kind of what you see as the life cycle of this data, recognizing that our climate is changing and the polar vortices are unpredictable sometimes. Um, how quickly does your data go stale and what, you know, do you need to be constantly launching balloons or kind of what, what is the duration of um, the value that you get from each balloon? Mm -hmm. So a balloon, once a balloon is launched, um, it'll fly for anywhere from a couple days to a couple weeks at a time. <clears throat> so, but the idea is that we're launching balloons continuously to get um, persistent coverage over a given area. So, um, the balloons provide value for forecasts for anywhere from, you know, a, a couple hours to a day in advance, all the way out to, you know, uh, potentially even sub-seasonal forecasts. Um, so there's a lot of value that can come even from longer scale forecasts um, from, from improving the initial conditions. But uh, this data could even be used in um, thinking back about historical data for like, in, for example, in the insurance industry. Um, there's value that this data can provide even after the fact um, for insurance, as I mentioned, and also for scientific uh, studies and learning more about the atmosphere um, through investigation of this data. And as a follow up to that, as I understand it, and you know way more about weather balloons than I do, but what you, you let it go and, and it's gone. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any part of, of this that is either reclaimable or recyclable or biodegradable or how do you handle if you're going to be constantly launching balloons? Yeah, yeah. So that's definitely at the top of our minds. So right now, um, our system is almost fully reusable, but it's very hard to recover them. Um, 
So what we do right now is buy um, plastic offsets. We buy double the amount of plastic offsets for every balloon that we launch. And in the medium term, what we hope to do is navigate balloons at the end of their life cycle to a designated like recovery zone. So we have them fly in, they land, we send out a guy with a truck and like he drives around the field and picks up all the balloons. We refurbish them, we launch them again. And in the very long term, what we're aiming for is full biodegradability. And uh, what's the cost associated with the balloon? So they're, they're very low cost um, compared to other technologies available. Um, I can't get into specifics, but uh, right now we're at low thousands um, per, per system. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. And then um, who would be kind of the main category of customer for the data that's coming out of the, the balloons? Yeah, so our, our goal is to be producing forecasts and ultimately insights for our customers. Um, the area that we're looking at first is the energy sector. So working with utilities, for example, um, to help them understand when, um, you know, I'll give the example of, of the cold snap in Texas, when it gets too cold for wind turbines to operate and when they have to start bringing on new um, generating capacity in the, in the form of the natural gas plants, help them manage that load, um, help them manage wildfire risk, um, that sort of stuff. But energy is one sector. There's really countless sectors that can um, find value in, these, in this weather information. Um, including the insurance industry, including agriculture, including um, shipping and aviation and transportation and retail. Um, so we, we plan to, um, to start small, start with one sector, and then eventually work our way up to, um, to coverage over a wide variety of sectors. Hey Paige, great job. I, um, you know, I think the slide that I sort of dropped my jaw. It was the team slide. You guys have phenomenal talent, SpaceX, Lyft, IBM, Fei Fei Li, all those pieces. Um, I want to better understand, this is kind of uh, going off of Jonathan's question. Mm -hmm. Seems like you found this space where it's like, hey, it's under six pounds, therefore we can go after it. What is preventing other people from saying, let's also do, you know, we got a bunch of people on this call. Maybe everyone else wants to make a five pound balloon. Um, what is the moat coming from? And is it the team? What other pieces are going into your moat? Yeah, the, the team really is a big one. We've spent so long working on this problem and it's really been our obsession from, you know, for the past like six to seven years. Um, but uh, and during that time, we've developed um, a lot of technology, especially around the altitude control aspects and the navigation control aspects. Operating these balloons in the atmosphere is very hard. There's not a lot that is known about the atmosphere um, other than like what the area where planes fly through and uh, understanding how to actually optimize this is a really difficult problem to solve. Um, you know, not the least of which there's also the hardware challenges in, in terms of adapting sensors to work with our system. Um, and in terms of even creating a system that functions at the low temperatures that are experienced up in the atmosphere and the hazardous conditions that are experienced up in the atmosphere. So. Um, that's, it's kind of all coming together. And the more balloons we launch, the more experience we get with operating this stuff, with the operations, with deploying launch contractors, with um, setting, up, uh, setting up these constellations and operating them. And so um, it, it just continues to be a positive feedback mechanism that we get more data and it builds our proprietary data set and gives us that advantage. Great, thanks. Okay, thank you Josh. very much. Uh, uh, yes. Josh, if we have time, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Greg has posed a couple of great questions related to environmental impact of balloons as they land and sustainability of the gas that's um, filling the balloons themselves. Paige, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you have a minute to, to answer those. Yeah. Uh, do we have more time? Well, yeah, well, actually, I was supposed to talk, talk about the question from the audience. So you have one minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which question uh, specifically? Do the gas one. Okay, the gas one. So helium versus hydrogen. So we actually use helium right now. We are thinking of switching to hydrogen. Crush that under okay. one minute. All right, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> um, any All other right. questions? 
Or right. Link. Okay. So I think um, you can even answer through the uh, the chat room to the directly to the uh, the, uh, the 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 people ask the question mm -hmm. while the, the next team is uh, presenting. All right. So thank you very much again, Paige. And this is a great mm -hmm. job. And this is, thanks a lot to judge again. All right. So uh, finally, uh, we have the last team now. So Mark is here. Uh, Bird Grace. Okay. Well, let me see. Here we are. Okay. Oh, Marco, can you wait for a little bit a minute for our judges to, to make the final score here? Okay, yeah. So um, Verdigris is a cloud-based AI and IoT energy management solution for a large scale portfolio. So they use the AI to pattern recognize and uh, disaggregate uh, the high frequency electric call signal and it uses a neural network to optimize control signaling uh, to the building. Uh, so Mark is here, so you have a uh, five minutes and then also again to 10 minutes of q and I think you can start now. Yeah, please go on. Great, thank you, Josh. Uh, hi everyone, um, I'm Mark Chung. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Vertigris. We are an AI company in Mountain View, California. We've spun out of a collaboration with NASA and we built to basically support, support the transformation of the electric grid. So why, um, why is electric grid so important? Well, it turns out uh, our product today is an energy management solution for mission critical facilities and, uh, and commercial buildings. And this is an area where there's highly concentrated electric consumption. And it's a huge problem. I think most people are aware that this is a huge problem for the planet. Buildings contribute vast majority of electric consumption and that's over 16% of carbon emissions today. Uh, the problem that we're trying to solve right now is that many of the companies that are now managing very large, complex portfolios are managing increasingly complex building and infrastructure. And unfortunately, over the last several decades, the tools that manage all of this complexity has not really improved. Um, so this is where technology can come in and play a big role. We've developed a IoT sensor that can map the energy uh, into digital software. Um, we have several patents around this system, and it starts with a very low-cost digital toolless clip-in sensor where we have removed all of the needs for complex IT integration and manual configuration and all the tooling and installation. Um, and what that allows us to do is um, take the data from that sensor and work intelligently with algorithms that allow high-frequency data that we're collecting from these sensors to fingerprint circuits. It's very similar to uh, facial recognition technology but we ultimately help automate labeling of the customer's data and create a very reliable granular labeled data set. So what was classically a huge data engineering problem for many of these uh, commercial facilities, uh, and especially for our largest enterprise customers, it's now a very automated self-labeling AI. And that means regardless of how the building is changing over time or being updated or transitioned or reconfigured, all of that data is always up to date and held reliable. And then we deliver all of this today as an intuitive SaaS software for energy managers and sustainability teams. And as a platform that ultimately can be integrated into various other enterprise business intelligence tools. Um, all of this means that we can seamlessly integrate this into automated reporting for carbon and carbon impact. Um, and uh, ultimately allowing us to um, add automation through AI controlled HVAC systems. Our next goal is uh, really trying to make all of this capability right now as a, a platform that becomes grid interoperable. So we can start transferring the power from these buildings back into the grid in a flexible way. Uh, we're currently the most scalable enterprise ready system in the market. Uh, we've been installed in over 22 countries. Um, many of our customers love us because we're focused on delivering a very easy retrofit solution without the costly integration. And our AI is enabling a very highly reliable scaled data set. Um, in terms of commercial momentum, a lot of it has been very recent. Um, over the last several years, we've been deliberately investing uh, millions into R&D, um, hardening our technology, focused on building a highly scalable enterprise grade product. And this bet has recently started to pay off with large commercial wins and, and new expansion projects with T-Mobile, Amazon, Arm, Qualcomm, Google, uh, many others. Um, today, we're accelerating a raise of capital to uh, increase our market penetration into the enterprise, as well as 
some of the network effects that we're beginning to see with grid interactive automated HVAC solution. And in the near future, we'll be expanding these virtual power networks and flexible grids throughout our customer portfolios in California, and then later into strategic markets in North America and globally. Um, we're also now in active discussion with a few OEMs to incorporate our technology and our hardware capabilities directly into their technology and embed it, um, creating a roadmap for our software to be more pervasive. Um, there's two dimensions of other players that are involved in this space and thinking about the viability of competition. Um, at, at, at its core, data scalability is really the important, one of the most important, important pieces of our solution as well as the stickiness and the depth of penetration of our product into the market. Um, Vertigris is sitting in this category of what I'll call emerging IoT enabled companies, where we are combining this lightweight sensor and integration capability to provide a very differentiated software product and data value at scale. And this is the category that I think is gonna ultimately win this uh, solution space. And I think we are uniquely positioned here with our proprietary technology. Uh, our found, founding team has a deep background in technology development. Um, in our last company, uh, John and I, we grew from about 30 people to an IPO and eventual $4 billion exit to Broadcom. Um, we've also built a pretty strong ecosystem of um, seasoned executives through an our advisory board and leading venture investors. And our goal is really to become the digital utility company for the next generation electric grid. So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mark, again, for uh, keeping five minutes time. Okay, so you can uh, stop the uh, screen sharing now, and then uh, let's move to the Q&A. All right, so B, yeah, you can start. Thanks, Mark. Um, you talked a little bit about this proprietary hardware, and I would love to hear a little bit more about um, what kinds of systems that's sort of being inserted into. If you could explain, like, what you know, what, what kinds of technologies are these um, between the commercial and the um, kind of critical mission critical facilities? Um, yeah. So today we we attach our circuits. I mean, our our circuit sensors is basically like a submeter into the electric panel of a building and it, um, it clips in to the electric panel. So you can think of like a patch panel in your house or in a, in a building. Generally, all buildings have this kind of um, electrical infrastructure. Uh, we clip in at that behind the meter infrastructure, and then we will collect all the data that's happening inside the building. And is that data being streamed to somewhere? Yeah, it's streamed to the cloud. It's, it's uh, well, so yeah, so everything today, we have a, our gateway device is a small little, you can think of it like a little cell phone without a display. Um, it has some packetization, encryption, some local compute, edge compute, and we sent it up to AWS. Um, and we run a lot of our algorithms and our um, software off of AWS. Jonathan, yeah. go for it. It's Jonathan, yeah, let's go on, yeah. I'll jump in here and apologies, my webcam seems to be uh, kaput right now. So Mark, uh, good presentation. Um, as you can imagine in the world of AWS and data center management, um, PUE or, or power usage effectiveness is top of mind. What type of PUE improvements are you seeing across your customer base? And how are you thinking about this as a measure of success? Um, that's a really great question, Jonathan. Um, so we do we do deploy our systems in a lot of data centers. Uh, PUE, the way that I we see our customers, including AWS, um, using utilizing our technology, is in the real time computation of PUE. So uh, I'll give an example. One of our customers is a very large telco. Uh, they have hundreds of data centers running around the country. Um, one of the biggest problems with computing PUE is they don't know their HVAC load and their electrical load. And, um, and they have to capacity plan. They're rolling out all sorts of 5G equipment, all sorts of data and all sorts of servers. We put that information out at the ready for them so they can, um, they can remove the design margin that is required to get the right amount of cooling, the right amount of power capacity. 
So we're seeing significant drops in PUE. I can't share like specific uh, numbers because they're proprietary for those customers, but but they're, um, you know, I think the industry, leading industry benchmarks around like Google and Facebook are are now achievable for a lot of the other customers that don't have the same kind of analytics capability. Great, thank you. Hey Mark, great job. I, um, you know, one thing that stands out is the fact that it's retrofit. Even when we're talking to like waste management startups, when they're able to retrofit for um, even setting up dumpsters in IoT, it's super helpful. I kind of wanted to get a little bit of sense for just your expansion and growth strategy. You have phenomenal customers. I saw NVIDIA, I saw ARM, Panasonic. Is the full plan to always be retrofit? Are you working with HVAC, OEMs? Um, maybe if you could talk a little bit about that scaling strategy. Yeah, I, I breezed about I breezed through that pretty quickly. Um, we do have, so yeah. 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 So we we do have plans uh, at the moment. They're longer term plans. So the biggest challenge we have in the marketplace is that we are a tech company, and most of the companies in this space are industrials. Um, uh, but there is a path which we believe it's a long path because these industrials are a bit, a bit slow where they will be embedding our technology directly into their um, devices. So an example of this, we are working with Daikin, we're working with Binning, ABB, um, Schneider to get them on the path of thinking more digitally and thinking about how to get the data sets that we need out of their systems. So we are, you know, there's work, I can't talk about all the work that we're doing, but there is embedded work that is being done right now to get our systems directly into these. They won't be ready for probably another couple of years into the market, but that is a long-term path so that the build-in for these will be like a kind of like a vertigris inside uh, strategy for, yeah, for the future. Awesome. Yeah. Hardware is tough. I think that's the right plan. <laughs> it's a long road. Yes. I think B, did you have another question? Oh, sorry. Could be. Yep. Oh, just a quick question about the hardware specifically and where it's uh, where it's being manufactured. Uh, yeah, today we we use a contract manufacturer out of China. Um, we're at a kind of a medium ish volume um, in the very short term. We're still going to be leveraging that um, in the medium term because we have some very large volume contracts ramping next year, including with um, a bunch of cell towers and um, I think what Amazon is planning with us. We, uh, we will probably be launching to a tier two in Southeast Asia. Great minds, similar question. Um, Josh, do we still have time for one more? Yes, you have, please go on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm curious, uh, you, you talked about um, kind of where this fits into the the ecosystem of where people are playing right now. Um, I'm curious in terms of when you're thinking about um, kind of the challenges around growth and you know potentially chip shortages and all the things that we're facing in the world right now. Um, you know how how do you kind of position yourselves against the uh, the EOMs and others eating your lunch? Is it is it in your models? Um, what is your differentiator there? And I'm curious. So if you could expand a little bit, you mentioned the goal of becoming, um, I, I may have misunderstood you. We're talking about people selling back to the grid or I, I was confused of how you fit into that um, marketplace. Yeah, so I heard two questions. One was a, a concern about uh, supply chain and supply chain risk that we have right now. Um, we do have that risk. Obviously as a startup company, we don't have the volumes of like Apple to command our lion's share of chip supply. Um, but we do have deep relationships uh, because we all came from the semiconductor industry. Uh, and in our advisory board, we have several folks. There's key, there's key parts and alternates. We have one of our guys running our supply chain is a 20-year veteran of Qualcomm's CDMA reference design business. So we have teams that are capable of helping us secure what we need. Um, one of the bigger challenges right now is that we probably have to park a lot of capital out there to secure some of these parts. Um, and you know, it, hardware is a capital intensive business. So that's, that's one of our biggest challenges. Um, but we're, we're navigating it. We have big pocketed investors who are flexible, uh, with us. Um, the second part of your question was about the, the virtual power plant. So it's, this is a new, I would say 
kind of on the horizon of things that we're thinking about and doing. There is a we recently launched a partnership with two companies in California, one called Recurve, one called Leap, where we will enroll our build because our buildings are not just measurement and instrumentation. We have the ability to dynamically control the HVAC systems. We can do things like use the capacity, the storage capacity of the building to move energy around. And it, you can think of it very much like a battery where, you know, in chemical storage, you can push energy in and then you can take it out like instantly. For um, these buildings, you can do something very similar through their thermal capacity. For example, we can pre-cool water in a chill water plant several degrees at like three or four o'clock when solar is out there. And then at five or eight o'clock when it's very expensive, dirty energy, we can reduce the consumption of those chill plants and let the temperatures rise, which reduces the actual demand in that period of time. And that demand response actually um, can be then resold to the grid through these partnerships. Um, and the, gr the grid will then pay, pay us and we can sort of double, double tap that um, energy saving for our customer and it generates additional revenue for them. I hope that was more clear. I appreciate the explanation. Thank you. Okay, hey, well, uh, thanks again to Mark uh, for your great presentation. Also, thanks again to all judges. All right, so okay, we uh, finished all four pitches today, and then thanks a lot to all the startup uh, startups, and then it, it was really great because I also learned a lot from your side, and then how you guys really make an impact to really combat climate changes. Okay, now it's time for our judges to make the final decisions. As, as I instructed, uh, you guys can connect to uh, another separate calling, but please make sure you have to mute here in Zoom so that nobody can listen to your secret you know, discussion here. So yeah, uh, please connect there and then make the final decision. Okay, so in the meantime, I'm going to give a little bit of introduction to the, the grand final and some of the other next steps. And also, I just wanted to also hear uh, some uh, voices from uh, the finalists about some kind of a recent current challenges that they are facing as a startup here. Okay, uh, so um, the winner of today's session will be invited to the uh, our grand finale at the end of this year, which was scheduled to be a 9th of December. And the grand finale will be also supported by some of our partners and sponsors uh, who are going to provide for example, 20K US dollar valued in a one year subscription for the uh, marketing automation system. And it's a due diligence offered by uh, uh, one of our uh, VC partner. So if you guys pass due diligence, and obviously you will, guys will have a more serious opportunity to get fund uh, from the, uh, the VCs as well, and also some of the other additional prizes. So I think it will be a very exciting session uh, and then the really uh, great uh, ending of uh, this program of this year. Okay, so while we are waiting for our judges to make the final decision, I just would like to ask one uh, simple, but I think important questions to our finalists today. Basically, you guys have a great pitch today about your business model, your future plan, but also I believe there must be a, some kind of you know, challenges that you guys are facing and some of the challenges perhaps will be not so easy for our startup to overcome only by themselves. Uh, it could be a challenges about some kind of regulations and policy, it could be challenges about some kind of technicality and, uh, and so on. So uh, just to share uh, uh, with us the, the latest challenges that you guys are facing and in terms of uh, technology, in terms of business development, in terms of uh, the relationship with the government whatsoever. And then that will be great for us to know so that we can also uh, try to uh, find the best way to help you guys also overcome those challenges. So um, maybe, maybe we can start with Peiji, if you wish. Sure, thanks. Um, so I, I'd say um, probably one of the biggest challenges we're facing right now is with supply chain. Um, as a small company, I, I mean, I think somebody else mentioned this, it, it can be, we're, we're not commanding the, um, 
the volumes of Apple or anything like that. And so um, it can be difficult when things go out of stock and uh, we have to make substitutions. And it's something that we're, we're dealing with actively, but it's an ongoing challenge that we have to be constantly aware of. Yeah, great, thanks a lot. What about to Cecilia from your side? Yeah, um, so I, I guess that for us, the challenge now is to continue to build upon our mission, long-term mission, and kind of helping our clients go through the whole digital transformation process, you know, kind of getting them to understand the value of data, even though we see um, you know, clients understanding real-time insights, which is what we're giving them now, you know, kind of helping them understand why you know, it is important to have a platform approach and why it is important to look at data as an ally for the future. And then also um, ac maybe accelerating enough, uh, fast enough to get, you know, to kind of democratize our solution worldwide. You know? Right. Uh, well, actually, coincidentally, well, uh, in previous session, one of the startups is, so we'll talk about exactly the same you know, challenges in terms of, uh, you know, educating the people about the importance of the all these things. But is there any way for you guys actually trying to do now to yeah. solve so, the challenge? Yeah, and that that goes in line with our um, business approach, which is like we I mentioned before, is top down. You know, uh, sorry, it's bottoms up. What we try to do is just show value in terms of efficiency and profitability for the client and then sustainability and more complex solutions come in hand with that. So once, once they start seeing the return on investment of the technology, then it's easier to engage in the larger conversation of the long term of technology and also sustainability. So even though we see sustainability and you know, more complex solutions are part of the equation, I, I think a lot of organizations also struggle to keep their operations efficient, mostly with COVID. You know, they need to kind of have resilient uh, systems. So what we do is really start where they need, right? Which is where the where do they have their pain point, show return on investment, and then continue to grow with them. I think that's what we, we have been proving that effective. Mm, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, what about you, Mark? Uh, what, uh, tell us about you know, some you know, big challenges that you're facing and how you're overcoming mm, okay uh well i think they're, they're like the traditional business challenges of hiring and onboarding like the great people and and and, and obviously supply risk but i think some of those actually could be solved with uh, capital i think my biggest challenge right now is we are sort of perceived as you know even though we are heavily software reliant we're perceived as like a very hardware dominant company so it, you know our revenues um and our SaaS are uh, not like in balance. So it's really difficult to find investors that can appreciate the stickiness of that piece um, and and also not afraid of the hardware. So there's like this gap. I think what I see in the, the institutional investment, there's climate tech investors that have been weakened after years and years of like just not really generating really good returns. And then there's like the... Um, you know, traditional VCs who are just really good at just digital investments and don't like touching hardware. And so we're like struggling to find the right capital partners that will, um, you know, we're, we're just relegated to just doing a lot of strategic investment at the moment. Uh, so basically that kind of funding strategy is something that all the startups are really trying to find the best way, I believe so. <laughs> but, and also, as you said, as you said, even if, okay, you, you know, secure the you know, fund and then, Mostly, you know, the fund will be used to find the really right people to join the startup to really, you know, scale up the business. So even if you got a fund, but also another next challenge is to find the right people. It's also always the, the same level of challenge to everybody. And so, yeah, I mean, good luck. <laughs> and then, so I hope you guys can have a really good, you know, really right partner. Of course, you know, you know finding a really right, you know, uh, investors is really, really important, but it also finding the right people. These two, you know, track is the really the fundamental for all those all kinds of startup to uh, to uh, to scale up. So, yeah, hopefully, yeah, we can see the uh, good, great, fruitful result from your side in next year, perhaps. Thank you very much for sharing it. Yeah, all right. So, well, it seems like our judge is having a really, really, yeah, serious discussion now. <laughs> So perhaps they are, okay, I think they're mostly done. Okay, thank you very much.
Okay, so I think, uh, Ali, so uh, as you turn on the camera, it seems like, you know, you guys finished your this tonight thing, right? Yes, and because we are AI for good, we're also judges for good. And so we wanted to make sure that there was sharing of wealth. So I'm actually gonna have B announce the winner and uh, share a bit about um, why we're really excited. Okay, thanks. Yep. Please go on. Yeah. I think you're on mute. It's not that you're on mute, but we can't hear you. I'm happy to uh, announce instead. I know we're a bit at time. Can you? Yeah, it seems like you're on mute, but yeah. Okay. I'll give another five seconds. But B, you want to give me a thumbs up if you feel like you fixed it or thumbs down if I should go for it? Maybe some kind of volume control in your computer, perhaps, because you muted, perhaps you just, you know. Uh... Nope. All right, I'm going to do it. Um, B, sorry, but I, I'm going to try and take every bit that we just shared in that last call and, and do you justice. So thank you to the four startups who presented. You all were incredible. I think even the questions that we were asking, we're talking about like five layers deep. You all did an amazing job getting so much information through in just five minutes. I think we were all incredibly impressed with not only your business and your team, but what you are doing for the world. So before I announce the winner, I wanted to just suggest that everyone in the audience take a second and really like look up these startups, reach out to these startups, contact these startups if there was interest in something that aligned with your business or your work. These are some of the top startups in the space, even picking a winner out of these four was incredibly difficult. Um, and another thank you to our judges. So Jonathan, B, Melissa, you all were incredible in participating in this and, and giving your time for such a great cause and UNAI for good, thank you so much. Uh, without further ado, I wanted to announce that the judging process was incredibly difficult, but we were able to come to a decision. And the winner of this pitch competition is Kettle. So thank you very much, Kettle. Your work in the reinsurance space is absolutely incredible. One of the things that we really appreciated was the fact that you're opening up those insights and allowing folks to access those insights. And so truly using AI for good. Um, again, thank you to all four startups that pitched. Nathaniel, congratulations. Pop a, a bottle of you know water, champagne, whatever you feel most comfortable with with your team. But thank you to all startups for pitching. Thank you to all judges and thank you to Josh and his team as well. Thank you very much, Nathaniel. Yeah, tell us how you feel. <laughs> thrilled, yeah, thrilled, thank you. Um, <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, it, it's an honor and, um, I, yeah, to, total honor. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's, it's exciting. Great to be here. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to have you again because you said you have another meeting at the end, but yeah, it's great to have Maybe you work. again yeah, at the final, uh, part of this session. All right. So, uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to send a separate information to all the finalists about some kind of feedback, the next step. And then also we, we'll, uh, we will have uh, some kind of you know, follow up closed session with the finalists to talk about, you know, uh, the feedbacks from the judges and also next step. And then some of the, the benefits that we are going to offer, especially to the winner at the grand final, as I mentioned, and the blah, blah, blah. Right. And then, Right, so before we close, uh, we have a small poll here. So maybe someone else from the, our team can pop up. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so how likely are you to recommend this webinar to a friend or colleagues and from 10 to one? Okay, so single choice here. Uh, but the judges and the panelists are not allowed to make this work for career. All right, okay, <laughs> great. Okay, thanks again to everybody and then thanks a lot. Um, so next Innovation Factory session is to be held on uh, 15th November with the another 
Uh, it will be last session focused on the startup based in Silicon Valley. And then as I mentioned, the grand final uh, pitching session will be held on 9th December. So stay tuned with us and hope to see you again next time. So have a lovely day or afternoon or evening wherever you are, even sweet dreams, maybe to my case. And then <laughs> thank you very much again to our judges and then finalists. And thank you very much for, to our, all our audience uh, to uh, attend this session. So thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, bye-bye. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector.